We're today at the large high performance outdoor shake table in San Diego, where we just completed a design level test, Loma Prieta on the 10 story building behind me. And your initial reaction to what you saw here today? Well, it's eight years in the making, so I'm thrilled to see full, you know, design level earthquake shake on a building that we've been designing and studying for almost a decade. So let's explore this 10 story coal form structure building on one of the biggest shake tables in the world. Ben Schaefer. I'm the Hackerman Professor of Civil and Systems Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Tara Hutchinson, I'm a professor in the Department of Structural Engineering at UC San Diego. So this facility funded by the National Science Foundation, total game changer for earthquake engineering, and recently upgraded additional investment from the National Science Foundation so it could operate in X and Y and Z. The motions that we view today demonstrated that that table upgrade was critical to the science that we do here. Most earthquake tests happen in labs on smaller, simpler scaled models. But in this, we can test a full structure weighing up over 2,000 metric tons, being subject to the full force of some historical earthquakes. You know, there's really only two places in the world um, that you could even get close to testing like this. The other one's indoors and you can't go this high. So this is it. Uh, if you want to look at, you know, higher uh, rise innovation for a system like this or whatever, we are the only place on the planet where it's possible. This building's made up of cold form steel panels. It's a really great material. It's sheet metal that is really rolled and formed into the final shapes that you'd be interested in. So you can think of like a, like a vehicle sheet steel. When you form it into the desired shapes, you do that while it's cold, it's at room temperature. So you end up with a higher strength material than traditional steels. You also end up with something that's of high precision, right? So you can cut it, you can use it in a prefabricated sense. It's, it's light, it's light. It started out with sheet steel. So you can transport it, you can move it around. And in earthquake prone regions, lightening up your structural system is gonna be critical because Newton's law doesn't go away. Force is mass times acceleration. If you reduce the mass, then you've automatically reduced the forces. That's really what we wanna do as structural designers. But the idea is to make a building that can be built off site, shipped and lifted into place and built with cranes, making it simple, quick and efficient. Other benefits that they're trying to aim for is something that's easy to fabricate, recyclable and also fireproof at the same time. So trying to wrap up many different parts that could be very hard to put in a single structure. I think we visually we're already seeing that our ability to understand this system, even though it's taller than we've gone before, stronger than we've gone before, is actually pretty well controlled. So we saw a response in terms of magnitudes, at least visually, that make sense to us that are similar to what we've been predicting in our models. So as engineers, we're pretty excited that we're on the right path with this kind of innovation. So this test is more than just testing an individual building, but trying to push the codes down a more sustainable and better route, pushing MCC construction into the future. One big message, if we have to get it out, is like to push the envelope for the use of light, high precision, perform steel materials like this in some modern high seismic zones. Right now, design code prohibits us from going above uh, six stories or 65 feet, whatever comes first. So a design engineer cannot use this material to go above that story level in building construction. We've already built it and now we've tested it under that design event and it looks and it attained its structural integrity. So I think we've already can say it's a success. The table weighs up to 150 tons and can move in six degrees of freedom. So you've got horizontal in one direction, horizontal in the other direction. You have vertical and you have twist, meaning that you can simulate any types of earthquakes possible. When, when you're putting things on a shake table, about trying to model the input from other earthquakes that's happened in the past. You want to try and use some real world examples of how the ground has shaped before. See, we have all these seismometers all around the world and they measure and monitor the input from those earthquakes. And so what we can do is put that same input back into the table to see how the building is going to behave on some of the biggest earthquakes around the world. Uh, so today we did two earthquakes. Three, two, two earthquakes. One was an earthquake that uh, originally happened in Turkey and the other was the Loma Prieta earthquake. You know, real earthquake motions out in nature, they impart uh, varying levels of excitation in both directions. Here we have the opportunity to study those motions and how they propagate through a building in, those bo in both directions as well. So we're looking at maybe two to three or even four times that at the roof actually. And so it's the roof mounted equipment, it's the roof diaphragm and the roof shear walls and other parts of the structural system that are gonna feel those larger accelerations. First earthquake we did, which was this Turkey earthquake, the actual earthquake you know, damaged an enormous number of buildings and it, it, it moved in X and Y, so in plane, but it also had a, a large pulse uh, vertically. And so we were able to replay that and get that into all of our sensors, something we definitely 
could have done before. That earthquake was devastating. So the chance to look at how that earthquake is going to behave here in 3D is fantastic. But more exciting was the design level earthquake we did, which was a scale off of uh, Loma Prieta from San Francisco. That was what we would call a design earthquake event. It actually has a likelihood of returning every 475 years. So, you know, in our lifetime, we might not see it, but is our lifetime happening tomorrow or is it happening next week or is it really happening 475 years from now so we have to be prepared for that and performing tests like this allow us to have some confidence that we are prepared for that let's say less frequent event but this is actually what a design engineer would be required to design for so we've scaled it towards that expectation so we're watching the building very intent on how it's behaving and we can definitely see that the building actually behaves with a little bit of twist and there's some uh, technical things between the center of mass and center of stiffness and we know they're not exactly aligned so we expect some but if we had just moved in x or just moved in y we would not have excited that mode the same way when we did that swoop just like loma prieta really did in x and y so that table upgrade all the difference for the science we made today so designers can't use this material for anything over six story we only have one landmark data set up to six stories now we can help uh, push the envelope in design codes and show folks that we can really we can really do it at the base of the buildings, we can feel accelerations of up to at least 1G. At the top of building, that's amplified by three to four times. So it could be three Gs at the top. Because of those dynamic actions of dynamic waves superseding on top of each other, meaning that the effect on the top of the building is substantially more than the effect at the base. Uh, one quantitative measure for us is peak ground acceleration. On a shake table, that's really peak input acceleration because the table re replicates that. Yeah. Here we imparted a peak input acceleration on the order of 0.3 g's that's 30 percent of gravity in one axis and almost 0.5 g's in the other axis so you know real earthquake motions out in nature they impart uh, varying levels of excitation in both directions here we have the opportunity to study those motions and how they propagate through a building in those bo in both directions as well so we're looking at maybe two to three or even four times that at the roof actually and so it's the roof mounted equipment it's the roof diaphragm and the roof shear walls and other parts of the structural system that are going to feel those larger accelerations so how do we actually get the results out of this building and what are we actually testing the building is wired up with many sensors and cameras and visuals of the critical components that we want to see we want to see how the stresses and strains go through the building how the connections distort and deform we also want to get the input about how they actually deform through the system because after the fact you may just see the damage but how did it actually get there so what you want to do is put the sensors on the actual components, see the strains that go through it, read it back to a monitoring system that you can then put back into the simulation and see how it actually affected and behaved. And those little interactions means that we can change the design, tweak it and make it better because we analyze the stresses, we analyze the strains. We're gonna see, but if we just change it around a little bit more, maybe we can make this area a little bit stronger or deform in a different way to perform better. The additional things that we also monitor is how the building drifts, the accelerations that we see on certain floors. So how much dampening or dissipation is actually happening in the system is extremely important. So we track every single performance and behavior on every single floor up and down the building and how each component behaves. That collapse potential is in the mind of society, but there's also the functionality aspect. So the ingredients inside of a building have to move with that building. The more they move, the more we have to design them to detach and, um, and move with the building, so to speak. Um, so it's good that, they, that the building did not move that much. And if we can transmit those forces, carry, the, carry that load throughout the structural core, then we can be comforted that structural system does what it needs to do. And the non-structural systems, the things that really make it functional for us in society, they also can accommodate those, let's say, moderate movements as well. So visually, yeah, you're standing back and you don't see significant or appreciable movement. That's a good thing. The final motion you saw was what we would call a design earthquake event. We expect the structural system to be uh, stable and retain its integrity. We anticipate some non-structural damage, some of the finishes, um, doors, potentially um, uh, perimeter or exterior finishes. We have a variety of gas uh, piping systems in the building, gas lines, fire sprinklers. We may see some damage of those non-structural systems in the building, but overall the building from a load bearing perspective should be uh, quite stable and uh, of high integrity. There's also videos from inside the building that you can show and interact with that because sometimes you might actually miss something from a sensor where you can slow down the video and see what actually happened on the building after that. 
earthquake. Sure, I mean, we're going to continue to scale up these motions and study the, let's say, what we call the nonlinear behavior of the yeah. building and its structural core and its structural and its non-structural systems. Um, we're going to take a few days with this data and digest it, try to understand it, and then scale up this particular uh, Loma Prieta event that you just saw. And these details are really important, as with any building, it's not just did the building survive, but if it's not functional, then it's not resilient. Can it be repaired? Can it be adjusted? Or does it need to be knocked down? Because if it needs to be knocked down, it's not really long-term efficient. See, codes are changing and how we have to design is also changing too. We need to make sure that buildings are resilient, meaning that they can withstand and be still functional after a big event. And if they're not, can they be easily repaired? Because you don't want a building that needs to be completely knocked down and rebuilt. Yes. It might have been cheaper at the time to build it that way, but a lot of the time, just some good detailing, good design means that you can make certain areas that can be repaired easily after such event, meaning the building is better for long-term environmental impact. This is actually something that's actually going to come into the codes more and more as we push through this century. So it's something that you need to think about now, and it doesn't really cost much, and only a little bit of thinking about how you can change your details to allow it to be easily repaired. Behind every bolt, connection and detail in this building. It's been someone that's poured over, done additional testing of the component levels, done additional calculations to back up their analytical and modeling assessments. Engineers have literally spent years, if not decades of their lives to get to this point where we can test this building. So it becomes a true turning point about how we can design and detail cold form structures versus the really small scale laboratory tests we've done before. So we've been testing single fasteners and moving them back and forth and understanding how this level of damage means this kind of strength. And then now we do it on a full scale building. If we can correlate that all together, then we can enable engineers to model this thing at essentially any scale they like and know exactly that the performance will be true. Having a benchmark like this is just, it's, it's you know, game changer is kind of a silly word, but that's the way I feel about it. But after the shake table is completed, it's only the first step along this way. There's gonna be months, if not years, of analyzing the results out of this test. Let's wait to see how the building actually performs after that fire analysis. And then hopefully these results can be shared to help shape codes, pushing us in the right direction of a more predictable and sustainable future. And if you did enjoy this video, you really like this one is, can we really design earthquake-proof buildings? If you're interested in supporting the channel, there is two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. As always, I hope you keep learning and I hope to see you next time. Bye.